Great, thank you. Um, this paper is based on an exhibition I organized a few years ago, Stephen mentioned, at the Jewish Museum in New York. Um, the Jewish Museum has had a long interest in Pizarro and the events of his times. We've had exhibition on, exhibitions on Pizarro as Impressionist innovator, Pizarro's Caribbean drawings, and my show of Pizarro in New York collections, as well as an exhibition on the art and politics of the Dreyfus Affair. As I was organizing the exhibition, one thing that struck me about the works I was looking at was the frequent motif of the path in Pizarro's imagery. This led me to consider the path as a way of delving into the confluence of Pizarro's painting and his ideological perspective. From his early sketches in St. Thomas in Venezuela to his late depictions of Paris and London, Pizarro utilized the image of the path as both a compositional element and as an expression of his constantly developing political beliefs and artistic ideas. The path, usually a rough winding road, connotes both rural labor, labor and leisurely strolls and calls attention to the intersection of nature and society, as seen here in this depiction of a railroad crossing. It can be viewed as the literal and figurative connection between the countryside and the city, a route Pizarro traversed countless times. In Pizarro's late cityscapes, the pathway takes the form of the urban street or boulevard, reflecting the social environment of the late 19th century. The concept of the pathway illuminates Pizarro's approach to art, shedding light on his retreat from conventional aesthetic and political attitudes, the relationship between the work of painting and the labor of the working classes in his work, and the links between his artistic and political ideas. Pizarro's beginnings as a Sephardic Jew from the Danish West Indies who grew up among the children of former slaves afforded him a unique perspective upon his entry into the Parisian art world of the mid-1850s. From the outset, he demonstrated an affinity toward the laboring classes and the idea of an integration of nature and society. Pizarro's mature artistic methodology is linked to his ideological outlook, which centered around a retreat from metropolitan systems of authority, such as government institutions and official art establishments, as well as religious institutions, including the Judaism of his parents. He held a belief in an egalitarian society, influenced by the anarchist literature he read. Although he never painted overtly a political themes, he strongly advocated art that upheld, quote, our modern philosophy, which is absolutely social, anti-authoritarian, and anti-mystical. In an 1872 painting, for example, a sweeping country road slowly curves around a small hill toward the foreground, focusing, on the work at the figure, uh, focusing the work on the figures at the center and leading the viewer into the scene. Two figures in a horse-drawn carriage descend toward the viewer as, female figures, uh, as a female figure climbs the brown, muddy road with her back to us. Here the approaching vehicle stands taller than the house in the background due to its placement near the top of the hill, yet is dwarfed by the bare tree reaching past the top of the canvas and into the winter gray sky. There is no hierarchy evident between the figures, only an integration of nature and humanity. The scene conveys a sense of slow but deliberate progression, people, animals, and nature, each moving along the course of their mundane but vital existence, perhaps acknowledging each other along as they go about their daily business. Pizarro's avowed attention is to avoid the narrative and the symbolic. Here, the path is not an emblem of progress as much as it is a physical and vis vis visual indicator of process. During the 1860s and 70s, when Pizarro was formulating his approach to painting, he was reading anarchist thinkers such as Proudhon and Kropotkin and uh, developing his adamantly leftist ideology. He had espoused Proudhon's belief that, quote, art cannot subsist apart from truth and, ju and justice, that science and morality are its leading lights, that it is indeed ancillary to these, and its first law is therefore to respect morals and rationality. His anti-bourgeois stance manifests itself in his desire to break down social hierarchies, class distinctions, and ethnic and religious differences, as well as the hierarchies in the established art institutions. Pizarro's uh, Brook at Montbuisson shows the artist's almost seamless integration of peasant life and the rural environment. A peasant woman, barely discernible among the autumn leaves and the earthy ground, bends over the banks of an even less visible brook, which forms a horizontal path across the lower part of the composition and further distances the woman from the small farmhouse beyond the trees. The separation isolates the figure within her work while integrating her into what Pizarro perce perceived as the peasant's intrinsic, intrinsic natural surroundings. 
The fact that Pizarro has given equal importance to the figure in ground and scale and mark making would have been perceived as anti-authoritarian statement, going against traditional artistic con convention and suggesting that the artist's egalitarian ideas are woven into the fabric of the composition. Pizarro spent much of his time in the 1870s at Montfoucault, the farm in Brittany of his friend, the painter and liberal politician, Ludovic Piet, where he had the opportunity to closely study a working, hand, uh, working farm firsthand. A scene from the farm in winter shows a man on horseback riding away from the viewer along a snowy path. For Pizarro, the path denotes a process of getting work done, both physically and ideologically. Pizarro saw himself as a worker, and deemed he worked laboriously on solving artistic, technical, and ideological problems in his art. I have the temperament of a peasant, he famously said. I am melancholy, harsh, and savage in my works. While he associated himself with the peasants, he recognized that he could never entirely divorce himself from his bourgeois background, calling himself a bourgeois without a penny. What did align him with the peasantry, however, was his marginal status in society as a non-French Danish citizen, an anarchist, and a Jew. His marriage to the non-Jewish Julie Vallée, a woman of the servant class, also linked him with the peasantry. For Pizarro, the work of the artist paralleled the work of the peasants he depicted. That is, the labor-intensive practice of painting with its individual rhythm and pace is akin to the repetitive labor of hoeing, plowing, or here shifting straw. For Pizarro, the work of painting was closely tied with his anarchist leanings, and this was embodied in the radicalism of the Impressionist technique. The unfinished look of the Impressionist canvases shocked conservative critics, one of whom, uh, upon uh, viewing an Impressionist exhibition in New York in 1886, declared that their work was a deliberate campaign against legitimate art. This unfinished quality is evident in this 1875 painting in which women work in a flurry of rough brushstrokes of paint laid down on the canvas with minimal mixing of colors. Another critic scornfully proclaimed that Impressionism in art is something parallel to socialism in politics. At an aesthetic and ideological crossroads in the mid-1880s, Pizarro embraced um, Neo-Impressionism and the rigorous divisionist technique and interest in color theory and read extensively about this topic. And this uh, painting is in the exhibition and uh, shows his interest in placing dabs of pure unmixed colors um, on the paper in this case to allow optical mixing by the viewer. One of Pizarro's attractions to Neo-Impressionism was its association with anarchism. Pizarro read the leftist newspapers, uh, Le Proletaire and Le Revolte, and works by anarchist writers, including uh, Félix Féninal, seen here in this work by Félix Vallotton. In an 1887 article on the new style, Féninal, who, who um, as Dana mentioned, coined the term neo-impressionism, wrote that a handful of artists, including Pizarro, Seurat, and Signac, achieved the sensation of life itself. This is because objective reality is for them only a pretext for the creation of a higher sublimated reality, which becomes infused with their personalities. Pizarro himself echoes Fenillon's idea in a letter to his son Lucian. I firmly believe that something of our ideas, born as they are of the anarchist philosophy, passes into our works. Pizarro here emphasizes the intellectual process as much as the manual process of painting. In this small painting on panel, a peasant plowing a field is nearly overwhelmed by the unmixed dots of paint and vi uh, vibrant colors of the new theory. While the technique is clearly neo-impressionist, what is more significant, perhaps, is the radical nature of the composition. The figure is now not simply equal to the background, but nearly obfuscated by it, going against all conventions of the hierarchies of traditional painting, clarity of vision, sub subject over background, drawing over color. Pizarro's constant experimentation with his technique produced questioning and even disdain from his critics, and his neo-impressionist works did not sell well. Yet he per persevered for a number of years. By the end of the 1880s, however, he felt that the labor-intensive process of painting uh, took him away from the spontaneity and sensations that had previously animated his, his work, and he abandoned the neo-impressionist technique. French politics, particularly the controversy surrounding the Dreyfus Affair, are integral to Pizarro's late cityscapes, even if they aren't readily visible. Rick Brutel and Joaquin Pizarro have suggested that this is especially true in his series of 10 paintings depicting the Avenue de l'Opera. Pizarro began painting from a room at the Grand Hotel du Louvre 
um, overlooking the avenue in 1887. It is very beautiful to paint. Perhaps it is not aesthetic, but I am delighted to be able to paint these Paris streets that people have, uh, have come to call ugly, but which are so silvery, so luminous and vital. This is completely modern. The modernity that Pizarro is drawn to is played out in his depictions of people of all backgrounds engaging in their daily activities. Pizarro was, however, acutely aware of the growing social unrest and anti-Semitism that had gripped Paris. In November 1897, he wrote to Lucian, I'm sending you a batch of newspapers that will bring you up to date on the Dreyfus case, which is so agitating public opinion. You will realize that the man may well be innocent. At any rate, there are honorable people in high positions who assert that he is innocent. As an anarchist, Pizarro did not immediately take a stance, but his humanism and anti-authoritarian beliefs prevailed, and his support of Dreyfus became ardent. Even before Zola published Chacuse, Pizarro had written to Lucian that the new brochure of Bernard Lazar proves that the document that the general uh, gave to the press is a forgery. And two months later, he reported, the Dreyfus case is causing many horrible things to be said here. Today, Zola accuses the general staff, but the bulk of the public is against Dreyfus. Public opinion was fiercely divided, as were the opinions of the Impressionist artists. But Pizarro's neo-Impressionist colleague, Paul Signac, expressed his strong Dreyfus stance in his journal of 1898. Quote, in the face of the screams of cowardice and infamy aroused by the courageous intervention of Zola in the Dreyfus and Esterhazy affairs, I ask that my name be put on the list of protesters which is being published by Laurent. I am in good company there. All those who think freely, all those who put dignity before interest, sign these lists which are growing daily. The Dreyfus affair alienated Pizarro from certain former colleagues and allies and caused him concern that he too would be the victim of anti-Semitic hostility. In a letter to Lucian, Pizarro relates the story of how he passed through a gang of, quote, young scamps seconded, seconded by ruffians who shouted death to d the Jews without recognizing Pizarro himself as a Jew, which is quite amazing because with his, uh, of course, long white beard, uh, even his friends and colleagues called him Moses. As was characteristic of Pizarro's work, his paintings from this volatile time in Paris never overtly depict anything political, such as demonstrators in the streets, and he reveals in his writings that he had attempted to separate the events of his day from his painting. Quote, despite the grave turn of affairs in Paris, despite all these anxieties, I must work at my window as if nothing has happened. However, of course, he's acutely aware of what's happening, and during the time he's painting the city scenes, Pizarro completed his Tributudes Sociales, which we're so thrilled to see here, um, illustrating his anti-capitalist and pro-worker beliefs. Lyndon Lachlan's groundbreaking essay on Degas' anti-Semitism delves into Pizarro's use of Jew Jewish stereotypes in these drawings for his figures representing the vices of society, reflecting the anti-Semitic sentiment of his time that linked Jewish bankers with capitalist corruption. Pizarro wrote, Unfortunately, the masses haven't the least understanding of what's going on. They assume a social struggle is being waged against capital without asking themselves who will be defeated. They dislike the Jewish bankers, and rightly, but they have a weakness for the Catholic bankers, which is idiotic. The Jewish stereotype that Pizarro chooses to illustrate his dislike of bankers was in keeping with the convention of his time. It's significant that these drawings were intended for private viewing, not public consumption, and Pizarro could not have anticipated that the stereotypical images he applied specifically to capitalists could be interpreted to apply to all Jews in the same way as the perversive, uh, pervasive anti-Semitic imagery in the conservative press. What is crucial to view, while it is crucial to view Pizarro's paintings of this time in light of the turpitude, it is also important to keep in mind that they have very different intentions and therefore utilize very different means of achieving their goals. Unlike his paintings, these drawings do not represent an ongoing process, but instead are an endpoint with a specific didactic message. The path motif, motif appears in early in Pizarro's work, seen in his Caribbean imagery of the 1850s painted in the first years after his arrival in Paris. Signed with the Sephardic spelling of his name when he was still working out his place in society. This painting depicts African Caribbeans walking along the pathway of the St. Thomas shoreline. The path signifies his interest in an understanding of aesthetic and political engagement as an ongoing process of, his, uh, process of historical progress. 
However, rather than present a finished didactic endpoint where everything is worked out and completed, his work is more complex, more fragmentary, more fragmentary and more modern in that it represents the passage from one place to another, the ongoing process of development. It is precisely this commitment to process that appears over and over again in his experimental techniques in changing subjects. If his interest in anarchist politics do not show up in literal or emblematic subject matter, it appears in the radical structure and form of the work, egalitarian approach to composition, willingness to experiment with touch, to reveal his profound interest in ordinary people and their social interaction. Perhaps most importantly, his pathways reveal a complex vision of modernity as a process that is not yet complete, but constantly in flux, similar to the busy comings and goings of the carriages on the Boulevard Montmartre. Thank you. <laughs>